Today I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, and we'll be looking at chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 3. Now, if you haven't been with us, the book of Hebrews, I said, is essentially a sermon, and that will really help understanding what is being said, particularly today, as we focus on the last statement of verse 6. Because some things in Hebrews is a bit confusing, but if you see it in the context in which, which it's given, particularly as part of a sermon, I think it'll make sense. Particularly all of the admonitions. Imagine a church service and, and you have a preacher who's expounding on these truths. Last week, we emphasized this statement that he makes, the preacher of Hebrews, to consider Jesus. It is not an option, but it is a command. It is a command given to the church called holy brothers, those who make up the regenerate church, those who are really saved. It's a charge to make your thoughts uh, about Jesus Christ, to be diligent in that effort, that is to be mindful of him, mindful of his person, his, his work, his promises, that th this should really be at the core of your being and your thoughts in daily life. Yes, we, we have other responsibilities, distractions, things we must do, but the center of it should be Jesus Christ. And it is a call for the redeemed church to make Christ central in all we think, in all we do. It is a command to believers. We call unbelievers to look to Jesus. We call them to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. But those who have been made alive in Christ are reminded to continually look to him. That is, abide in him or in the wording of our text, consider him. Consider him as a member of the very household of God, as a great privilege. Our focus, I said, is this day is going to be at the end of verse 6 in chapter 3, where it makes this statement, where his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in hope. This statement here at verse 6 really functions as a transition, if you will, to verse 7, which we're going to address next week. Verse 7 begins another warning passage, and we'll emphasize that next week. Today, we wanted to look at this idea and this call of holding fast. This is a way the preacher of Hebrews deals with a doctrine which we call perseverance, and in particular, to whom it's charged to, that is, holy brethren or the saints, the perseverance of the saints or holding fast. Let's go ahead and read the text, and we'll look at it in its immediate context beginning at verse 1 of chapter 3. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. 
Let us pray. Father, I do pray that you would grant us insight and understanding of your word. I pray we would hear and heed what Christ would say to the church, to this church, today. I pray it in his name. Amen. Now I said this last sentence here, where his house, if indeed we hold fast, is essentially a transitional type statement. It's a transition to the second warning passage that is given here in Hebrews. Notice in verse 7, this conditional statement, this if indeed, it should cause the hearer to sit up and take notice, and particularly not only to, to this introductory statement, but also the formal warning that is to follow in verse 7. Do you see it? Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, so here is divine word from God, what? Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. So, so this statement here about we're his house, if indeed we hold fast, it is to introduce that very stark warning statement. Don't harden your hearts when today. These warning passages are important in the flow of this sermon to the church. And you're going to see these sprinkled throughout this letter. Because imagine, if you're preaching along, then all of a sudden you stop and give the church a warning. That's the point. This is the second major warning, beginning in verse 7 in our text. You remember the first one from chapter 2? You've got your text there, easy to turn back. Verse 2, verse 1 of chapter 2, Therefore we must pay closer attention to what we have heard. What did you hear? Well, you just laid it out in chapter 1, all of this about who Jesus Christ is, his person, his work. Pay close attention to it, lest you drift away. And then in verse 3, how are we going to escape if we neglect so great? And by the way, great in the sense of the immense immenseness of it the enormity of it these this sermon itself in the book of hebrews and you can note these warnings that just keep coming it's a it's a warning against apostasy that is falling away from the faith here in chapter 2 it uses this imagery of uh, of a, of a ship just drifting away the church is called then to, to pay closer to attention like a mariner would to his mooring lines to make sure they are secure. A ship that is untethered is going to be subject to the winds and waves. Paul uses this imagery to call the church to spiritual maturity in their case, and that is that you should, for Ephesians 4, 14, I'll read it for you, so that we become spiritually mature so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine and human cunning by craftiness in deceitful schemes. The wind and waves are analogous to the deceitful schemes of Satan, which will lead you to the depth of destruction, and the great danger is it may lead to apostasy. And so the warning, the warning to the ch church in general, and for those that are truly regenerate, which we'll get to in a bit, it is, a, it is an applicable warning as well because you're going to lose in your instability great assurance that you have in Christ, the great joy that you have in Christ, the great delight that has been provided, the comfort, great warning. This conditional statement here in our text in verse 6, the condition you note here, if indeed, 
is thrown in there. Now, this, this can be confusing, again, to some. In fact, some will read this statement, well, we're his house if we hold, if indeed we hold fast. And so, pulling it from its context and, and the way in which it's expressed, some might think this is some sort of condition, holding fast, that salvation then would be dependent on your holding fast, you doing your part. In fact, I would say that is actually the majority of the opinion of those who might call themselves Christians today. The, the idea is that, well, God does his part, all that he can do, and then you do your part, all that you can do, and it'll all work out. Now, if you preach that, well, the majority of folks out there will say amen. But that's not biblical. That'd be an acceptable understanding if we didn't have the Scriptures. That would be an acceptable understanding if you didn't have just this letter alone, this sermon. The context demonstrates that that is, in, that is not what it's talking about. You doing your part and God doing his. We'll explain more of what it is, but and looking in the context here in Hebrews, I think it'll help, and we'll expand it to some degree with the, depending on our time in the Bible in large. But in any case, this is an important concept that we need to understand and know as a church, this idea of holding fast. This holding fast, as he uses it, I've defined it as perseverance. This is a common statement that the preacher of Hebrews will use. Look down to verse 14 of the same chapter. We have come to share in Christ, so you're a Christian, and notice the condition, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. So it's essentially the same type of statement. If you flip over to chapter 6 and notice verse 11, he says, we, we want each one of you to show the same earnestness and to have fur, full assurance of hope until the end. So it's expressed a different way, but the idea of you, you have this assurance of salvation all the way to the end, that is, to the end of your days. Chapter 10, and verse 23, another admonition. Let us hold fast... No, phrase is used there, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. And then he adds, for he who promised is faithful. And I think that should give you a little bit of a clue of where he's going with that. The church, Christians, the truly regenerate then, however, are called to hold fast, Hold fast what? Your faith, the confidence in it, the assurance in it, the hope of it until the very end of your days. This is charged to the church. It's described in chapter 3 as the house. We're his house. You can understand this whole idea of the house because that's what it's it, the imagery that's being used here in comparison to Moses. The family of God is the house that they're talking about, the family of God in Jesus compared to Moses. Notice verse 1 of chapter 3. Holy brothers who do what? Who share in this holy calling. And then it speaks of Jesus to consider him and notice, compare, compare that with Moses, who was also faithful in all of God's house. So where is house? That is the house of Jesus Christ or God. And the comparison is Moses, who was faithful. 
So the, the charger is here to be faithful in your house, that is in Christ. Faithful, how? Well, Moses was faithful. Now, if you know much about Moses, we gave it briefly last time. But he certainly wasn't perfect in his faithfulness, was he, in his house. But yet he's described here as being faithful. It's, it's not faithful in that he didn't ever fail. He did. But when he failed, he repented. When he failed, he returned. And so the description then is one who endured to the end, one who is faithful to the end. That, that, that's what, that's what the, the comparison is. And for those that are holy brothers, those that are Christians, they're called to be faithful in the house, the family, Christ. We have a holy calling. Individually, those that are in Christ and then collectively together, the redeemed, make up the household of God. And by the way, God's house isn't a building, it is a people. Now, we meet in a building, and we call this the church, that's fine. We call it a sanctuary because this is where God's people gathered. But the house is really the people. That's what he's talking about. Both individually and collectively as a house of God. Or another way to think of it would be a family of God. So let's look how the Apostle Peter describes this in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2. First, if you want to turn, 1 Peter chapter 2. Using this imagery of a household and calling God's people to endure, he says it a little differently here, but he begins in chapter 2 of 1 Peter then to, to put away those things that would be shameful in the house, malice, deceit, hypocrisy, slander. Th those things have no place in God's house, so, so put that away. Instead, grow up in maturity, he calls the church, like newborn infants, if you will, want milk. So those that are in Christ want to grow in Christ and drink spiritual milk that they would grow up in their salvation, that is, their, their sanctification, their holiness, putting away the deceit, hypocrisy, and slander. And why would you do it? Because it's good. And the analogy fits, just like a, an infant would, would want something nourishing, which is good. They have a great desire for that. They will cry out if they don't get it. That's the idea of those that are in Christ. They have tasted indeed that the Lord is good. Now here's this stone and building and house analogy that he shifts into in verse 4. You, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. That is, you know, most people are going to have and do reject Jesus Christ. But in the sight of God, he's chosen and precious, that is Christ. And you yourselves, like living stones, are then being built up as a spiritual house. That's the imagery that's brought out in Hebrews as well. We are his house. What house? A spiritual house. And what would this house look like? It would to be it is it to be a holy priesthood that is sanctified and set apart, functioning as mediators here in the world in which we live, one with another and with the world in general. And they are offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, picking up your cross and following him in obedience, if you will. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, a chosen, precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. That is, believe in Christ, trust him, you will not be put to shame. 
So there is great honor then for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, those who would reject it, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you, speaking of those that are the spiritual house, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. That's the imagery here back to Hebrews chapter 3 when he talks about your, his house. We are his house. That's the house that he is talking about. A chosen, royal, holy people who are then to keep their conduct among Gentiles honorable because ultimately they will see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of their visitation. That is their day of judgment. This is the house that he's talking about. This house Chosen, holy, made in the lineage of Christ, if you sense, that royalty, a people. That house is then built by Jesus Christ, you understand. It is Jesus himself who is the builder. Look at verse 3. Jesus has much more glory than Moses. Moses was thought of as having great glory and understandable. He, he does uh, hold a strong place in, in Judaism and appealing back to Christianity, as we read earlier in John chapter, uh, what was it, 5, that he, Moses spoke of Jesus. We read earlier all that he spoke of, pointed to the one who would ultimately fulfill it. it. Jesus, verse 3 in our text, has more glory than Moses because why? Note this. He is the builder of the house. What house? That spiritual house that we're talking about. Those that are individually and then collectively called the church, the family of God, the house. He is more honorable because it is Jesus Christ who is the builder of that house. He is the one who puts it together. He is the one who makes the choice, who engages and, and um, regenerates those that would be a part of it. And he gets more honor than the house itself. And notice verse 4, every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. And here is another affirmation of the deity of the builder, Jesus Christ, who is indeed God. So we are his house. What, what house? This holy people of God built by Jesus Christ. In fact, do you remember when he told Peter, who he asked, what do people think about me? And there's a lot of nice things about him. And what did he, Peter say? Well, you, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. You are indeed Lord. And Jesus affirmed that and said, yes, indeed. He says, and I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell is simply an idiom for death, if you will. He's going to build his church. He's going to build the spiritual house individually and collectively of those that are truly born again, 
regenerate, if you will, and what is going to stop it? Nothing. Not even death, because the gates of hell or death are the entryway into glory. D do you get what he's pointing at here? He built it. It will continue to the very end. Not even death is going to stop it. He's not talking about an organization. He's talking about a collection of saints, his people. That is his house. It's a house in that it is a family of God. Nothing will stop him from building his church, not even death, because he has conquered it. If you're in Hebrews, look back in chapter 2. Do you remember? Verse 14. Christ then takes on human flesh and blood and he shares in humanity and he, take, and he partook of the same things that, I'm in 2.14, that through death then he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to a lifelong slavery, that is bondage to deliverance. He delivers from death. Christ is the builder of the church. He, he is the foundation of it, the builder of it, the protector of it, the keeper of it, and those that are in Christ will endure to the end. He will deliver them. So there's no fear in death. Death is swallowed up in victory in Christ Jesus. Outside him, be, great, be in great fear. Paul would close his chapter 8 in Romans with this memorable statement. 8.35, I'll just read it for you, listen to it. Who shall then separate us from the love of Christ? Do you know the love of Christ? What's going to separate you, church? Tribulation? Distress? Persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or even the sword. Or in our day, nuclear bombs, maybe. No, as it's written, for your sakes we are being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And that's key. What, who, what is going to separate you from the love of Christ? God has loved us. I'm sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the security the believer has. That's the house that he's talking about. Jesus would say in John chapter 10, if you remember, I give them eternal life. They will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. Why? Because my Father who gave them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So this condition then of God's house here, if we indeed, isn't contingent upon those who are in the house, who are, make up the spiritual family, uh, remaining in the house isn't ultimately contingent upon us, and I'm glad of that. Remember, Moses' faithfulness, in comparison, he wasn't perfectly faithful. But he returned, and he endured to the end. He did hold fast. That's the point. Our remaining in the house isn't contingent on our perfect faithfulness. It's contingent on Christ's. Paul would tell his young protege, 
in 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. What did he say? All the Father gives to me will come to me. <laughs> They're never going to perish. They will endure to the end. That is a statement about the very house of God, this spiritual house. You know, all of the promises that he made would be void if those that are part of the family of God, those who are indeed in the house of God, are able to lose that privilege and get kicked out. They never will. So then the question is in our text, then why throw this conditional statement if indeed we hold fast? I know I won't get through all of this, but let me just give you some thoughts and we'll move forward to the degree that we can. But this statement back in our text, we're, we're, we're his house, that's what we've talked about, it's built by Christ, it's kept by Christ, it will endure th to the end, death won't even stop it, it will be a very delivery into the very presence of God, so then why bother with this if indeed we hold fast, if, if indeed we continue, if indeed we, we endure, if we preserve? Persevere, should I say. Because, here's the answer, really. This holding fast, this continuing, this constant returning to repentance and faith is evidence that you're in the house. And, beloved, by doing so, it'll also provide not only evidence to others, but to yourself. We call that assurance to believe. If you engage in activities that are not commensurate with the spiritual house, you're, you're going to struggle in your assurance with God. And if it is demonstrated that you don't hold fast to it, it is, it is indication that you're not in it to begin with. This idea of holding fast, let me just um, expand that a little. This passage here, remember, is a message by the preacher of Hebrews to the Hebrew believers. It's to the church. And it follows what the preacher is doing, if you followed along thus far, his argument to them, particularly in that environment, was Christianity is better than Judaism. The argument has been made so far that God did send many Jewish prophets. Christ is superior. He also sent to them angels. Even the law came through angels. Jesus is better. And now he mentions Moses in chapter 3, Moses who represents all that came before, the Old Testament in general, the Old Covenant, and Jesus Christ is better than that. What he's saying it, to them in particular is, don't go back to that. Jesus Christ is superior to Moses. Moses was an apostle. Jesus is the apostle. Moses, he's a member of the house. Jesus is the builder of it, remember? Moses is a man. Jesus is God. Moses is a servant. Jesus is a son. Moses told of things that were to come. And Jesus is the, is the fulfillment of that promise. And not only now, but in all that will come. This holding fast 
in its immediate context is an admonition to them in particular not to forsake Christianity for Judaism specifically. That's the immediate um, context of, of, of his point. Because in their sense, and, and here I'll walk you through some of Hebrews to see it, chapter 6, he's saying, okay, if you, if you forsake Christianity and you go to the rituals of Judaism in which you grew up with and those traditions that you were familiar with, it's going to be, chapter 6 and verse 4, it's going to be impossible if you fall away, verse 6, to come back to repentance. You have to come to Christ and going to something else. You're not going to find forgiveness and repentance in some other religi religious system. Chapter 10, again, another warning, verse 26. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sin. Why? There's only one sacrifice. It is Jesus Christ. In chapter 12 and verse 25, again, don't refuse him who is speaking. Because if you refuse him who spoke on earth, how much less shall we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven? This idea of holding fast specifically for this audience, primarily their circumstances was the temptation to go back to the culture, the society, all that everyone else holds to and believe. And it's a great warning for them not to walk away. It's a warning of apostasy. That's ultimately what the call is. An apostate is one who affirms the faith superficially, but never really attain the faith supernaturally. And in a church setting, whether it's them in the first, set, first century or us here today even, there may be many who appear to be adherents of faith. And the warning is, don't turn away from it. Don't walk away from it. Going back to Judaism in their circumstance is backwards. It's apostasy. Forsaking Jesus Christ for anything else is apostasy. There is only one mediator between God and man. It is the man, Christ Jesus. And so this warning then is, don't fall away. Examine your own heart, if you will. There are people who would affirm Christianity, and you might think very well of them, and then they turn around and deny it. Good people, nice people even, not just rogue thugs. I'm reminded of a recent apostate, very articulate, very nice person. I'm sure a lot nicer than me. That's not hard to be, but in any case, I don't know if you remember Josh Harris. He had a big splash in 1997 as a young man, encouraged people to engage in relationships differently, he wrote a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye and made a lot of money on it, but it was a good idea and concept and that really brought him to great fame and eventually he was made pastor of a mega church and then uh, decided he might want to get some theological education. Probably should have done it the other way around. But in the end, he, it uh, became too overwhelming for him. Apparently, he kissed Jesus goodbye. He said, well, how does that happen? Well, you don't take this warning seriously enough. This is a serious warning. It, it isn't just because you have some good affirmations. It isn't just that you 
practice in a certain way and try to fulfill some religious requirements that maybe you should actually do and all, it gets back to the very heart of the matter. And that's what the if indeed is. We are his house. And how you know, if you persevere, that's how you will know. That's how others will know. It, 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 that doesn't achieve the putting you in the house, keeping you in the house to the end. It's just a demonstration whether you were there or not. And it serves as a wake-up call because another strong warning is going to come in verse 7, right? It's today, don't harden your heart. That's what he's saying. Because Jesus knows right now. I don't know. And you know what? You could be confused too. I'm sure Josh was. I'm sure he thought he was in the house for a long time. But those that are in God's family, Christ will keep them. And they will not walk away. I suppose in his case, it's possible he could have just been going through something and turn and repent. That's possible. And I pray that he does. But if he doesn't endure to the end, if he doesn't hold fast to this truth, it simply shows he was never there to begin with. Remember when great crowds came to Jesus in his life that we're reading about, John chapter 2, you know, they saw the signs that he did, the miracles, they all started coming around. I mean, who, who wouldn't to see all that Christ would do? Just we, we can't even get a glimpse of how incredible it was that just by the word of his power, he, he could uh, heal people immediately. You have, you have a love member that's sick, that needs healing? And even to the point of death, he could actually raise the dead? You've never seen somebody with that kind of power. you imagine how incredible that is? And could you imagine what great crowds that would draw? <laughs> and it did. In fact, in John chapter 2, the way it ends, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's near the big city at the Passover fe feast. And there are many that believed in his name. That sounds good. Because they saw the signs that he was doing. I mean, how would you not? But here is the devastating part. But Jesus, and I'm reading, I'll read it for you, John 2, 24. Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So the question I like to ask sometimes is not something... Not necessarily do you know Jesus, is it, does he know you? Jesus doesn't need the demonstration of it because he knows what's in the heart of man. Jesus knows his sheep. They hear his voice. They follow him. But the real question is, how, how, how do we know? Or how can you know? And based on our text in Hebrews, it's real simple. Hold fast to your confidence and boasting in our hope. It's like a little, you know, warning light here to, to, as a reminder to hold fast. Because those who do not hold fast, those who do not persevere, were never in the house to begin with. And this isn't just my deduction. You can hear it straight from the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. They would endure to the end because Jesus promised that. So leaving is just demonstrating you were never apart. Instead, God in his grace allows them to go out, he says, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us, because otherwise it isn't that plain. And it certainly isn't helpful. 
The call then, beloved, within the church is to examine your own heart. Paul would tell the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Do not realize this about yourself, that Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. That's the call. And it isn't just an external examination. People can get along socially and be acceptable externally, even affirm a lot of facts and statements, what is really going on is, do you have a regenerate heart? Jesus knows I don't. I wish I had that. The preacher of Hebrews doesn't either. That's why he keeps giving these warnings. That you would have a real faith, a genuine faith, an active faith. Saving faith is evidenced in our love for Christ and demonstrated by our obedience to Him. If you're trying to teach this to your children, by the way, or maybe even to yourself, I think my illustration I like to use helps in understanding saving faith, if you will. It's not perfect, but it's easy to remember because it's alliterated. And everybody knows if it's alliterated, it's got to be good. Okay, except for Andy, he doesn't agree. But I digress. Genuine faith. Say, well, what if I have all these good actions? By the way, Judas had all these good actions, but he blew it with one of them for sure. And then he seemed to be sorry about it, but he was never one of them. So how would you know? Well, I put it this way. One is the head. And that is, you need to have an absolute agreement with the facts, if you will, the mind. An intellectual agreement that of, of all of what is being said, you, you need to know the gospel. You need to know about yourself, your condition before God. You need to know about Christ who came as the mediator to atone for your sin. That's important and true, and some people stop right there. The second aspect is, is, is the heart, or at least how we think of the heart as a seat of affections in our culture. That you would have a personal affection towards the truth, not just an agreement intellectually with what's going on, but something on the inside that has genuine affection towards the truth. Is there anything there? Does the Spirit of God actually work on your heart? Do you have a, a passion on the inside, if you will, that goes beyond the letter and the ritual to reality? And the third illustration would be, that goes with that, would be the hands. That is, genuine actions that are produced by the Holy Spirit. One of the greatest assurances of faith I had one time, it just, it stays with me, it overwhelms me. Because I was in a situation where I did something um, wrong at least according to the other person. <laughs> I thought I was right. I still think I'm right. <laughs> but I really was wrong. And I walked away from it, but there was something on the inside, a genuine action on the inside that caused me to want to go seek forgiveness and restoration, even though it was this other person's fault <laughs> all the time. Because it really was my fault. And God worked on my heart. And that relationship was restored, and that's a great thing. But beyond that, you know what was restored? My assurance. I'm glad that God just wouldn't let me be. He, he just wouldn't let me go. 
If you sin, beloved, don't hold fast to that sin. You're going to lose fellowship with the saints, communion with God, and individually the assurance of his great salvation. It, it needs to really permeate your own heart, true saving faith. This belief certainly in the content and that it's certainly true for you and that it actually affects who you are and what you do. And oftentimes it's just responding as, as David did in calling on God to give him a clean heart. Well, I'll finish up with this back to our text here with one more statement, and that concerns hope. We're his house, so we need to hold fast. And the scripture says, verse 6, that we, what is it that we hold fast to? It's described here, and again, this isn't to be comprehensive, it's just to be um, illustrative to some degree, but ultimately it, it, it focuses on our hope. This boasting idea is boasting in the sense of, of confidence. Notice how they're related here. This is boasting in the sense of delighting in, being satisfied in, having great confidence in, where? In, in God. Th that's, what we're going, that's what the charge is to hold fast to. Delighting in the assurance and the hope of God. Jeremiah puts it this way in, in his prophecy in, Je in Jeremiah 9 and verse 23. I'll read it for you. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. I think that's what he's getting to. This message here in Hebrews not only serves as a great warning for, those, for apostasy, to examine yourself, to make sure that you're in God's house, if you will, that you are truly part of it, but also a reminder to the believer of the confidence and boasting in the sense of great delight and joy that is granted to those that are in Christ, that those are in his house. You have this word, underline it, hope. Hope, particularly then and any time, really, in a hopeless world. The call is to have Godward affections that hopes in Christ. Andrews, in his commentary, describes hope this way. In particular, here in Hebrews, he says, The writer means an expectation of all that is promised to us in the gospel of Christ. I think that's well said. I'll say it again. An expe expectation of all that is promised to us in the gospel of Christ. You see how it fits with considering Christ? You think about all that is promised in Christ. The settled then assurance that what God has promised us in Christ, He will surely fulfill. Hope is the certain knowledge that in life we have His presence, grace, power. That in death we have the promise of resurrection. And, in, and that in heaven we have a place reserved where we shall behold the glory of Christ and inherit the riches of His kingdom. That's a lot of hope. <laughs> Do you have it? Th that's the positive end of of holding fast. What are you going to hold fast to? The hope that is in Christ Jesus. The psalmist 
examined his own heart and asked himself, there are several places in the Psalms where this is, 43 is one of them I'm thinking of, but he says, um, why are you cast down on my soul? Why are you in turmoil, hope in God? Praise him for his salvation. For those that are in the church, we know that hope has been realized in the person of Jesus Christ, who fulfilled all that he has indeed promised. The writer of Hebrews will explain that our hope is not wishful thinking. We hope we win the ball game. And when we do, well, we're glad we did. But we could have lost it. That's not what kind of hope he's calling on us to believe. He'll explain this in chapter 6 about the promises that we have that are based on the unchangeable, I'm reading 6.17 for you in Hebrews, the unchangeable character of his purpose. He granted it with an oath. He swore by it, all his promises, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge, that is in him, we have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope before us. And so for the Christian, it is to hold fast this hope, this hope that is given by the very promise of God, and God cannot lie. That's how secure that hope is. So he describes it this way. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul a hope that enters into the interplace behind the curtain where Jesus is gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Beloved, we live in a hopeless world, a world that's contaminated by sin, death, destruction. But the confidence of this hope is the expression of our reality. Could you imagine... What if you saw a historical documentary and you know the outcome of what has happened in history, whether it's you know, a mountaineering event or something in war? If you ever watch those kinds of things or even read, you can gain, I understand, you can have a little bit of anxiety along the way, as you do, don't you? Even though you know it's certain. <laughs> and sometimes you have to remember uh, it is certain. <laughs> the, the end is fixed. It's, it's known. And that's the point here. It in our circumstance, for those that are in Christ, you know the end. Death is swallowed up in victory. All the evil that you might know and deal with will be done away with. The cursed world, even in which we live, the devil has been conquered and will be done away with. In the meantime, we wait, confident in our hope, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Father, I do pray that you would increase the hope of those that are truly in Christ. For those who had ex examined themselves and found themselves perhaps outside, I pray they would be brought in today. You will not cast away anyone who comes. And so we pray that many sons and daughters will come and find their refuge in you and realize the hope in Christ and Christ alone. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.